So first, thanks uh, for, again for that. That was a wonderful panel. Brandon, great moderator, Terrence, Suli, Miles, Sharifa. That was incredibly in inspiring and instructive and moving. Thank you again for being here. Um, this panel, I, <clears throat> when, we, when we first were organizing uh, the 50th anniversary, when I was thinking about something that I really wanted to do, uh, was talk a bit about uh, <clears throat> doctoral instruction, PhD, PhD program. And it's one of the things, it's not a thing that I, I, I think was on the minds of a lot of the students in the late 60s and early 70s that we would like go right to like <laughs> granting a PhD in, in black studies. But, um, but over time as things evolved, it's, a, it's become a, a, I mean, more than 15 departments are granting the PhD. It's uh, when I was first hired, our, um, uh, and one of my mentors, Kwame Anthony Appiah, who I met when I was an undergraduate at Florida a um, was on the faculty and chair the committee to write the draft for uh, our PhD program. And I remember when I was first hired, it was sent to me in the mail, and I read through the whole thing. I was, this is amazing. I cannot believe, you know, right? we're, we're doing this. And I come in, and we have our first class in 2001. There are so many stories we could tell about, uh, you know, the, the first class that we brought in, and we had... I think there were five students, and they were in the room with the entire faculty, and we would not let them talk. We just talked to each other. <laughs> that was a really bad idea for pedagogy, but it was fun for us. Um, but here are some, now it's 20 years later, there are a bunch of questions about, you know, what does it mean that we're granting a PhD in African American Studies? How should that be built out? How should we um, <coughs> a, a, approach our place in higher education? Where this, where we see ourselves as a permanent part of the development of higher education, and there, there are many issues. And so I wanted to, to invite some people who I know have reflected on these issues from different perspectives, different institutions, to, to think through them um, with us and to talk with you about some of these issues. Um, Martha Biondi, as you all know, wrote the book, really, on... on uh, the history of black studies uh, with uh, black revolution on campus. Uh, was one of the first people that, that came to mind and wanted to put together a panel like this. She's, of course, the Lorraine H. Morton Professor of African American Studies and Professor of History, also Director of the Center for African American History at Northwestern. Um, Jennifer Nash is one of our own PhDs, uh, now a professor at Northwestern and brings a unique perspective to um, having been in two different departments. Uh, trained in ours, and not just in another uh, Africana, African American Studies department, <coughs> and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to uh, give us a, a unique outlook on different ways of approaching our enterprise. Barbara Savage is the Gerald R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought, Department of Africana Studies at University of Pennsylvania, a former chair of that department. Um, very much, very pleased to have you here, Barbara. And, and, um, Looking forward to another department that has a PhD program uh, and takes up these things in somewhat different ways. And finally, uh, Olufemi Taibo is a professor of African political thought and department chair at Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell. Now, I think in his second year as chair as well. Uh, we're you know, commiserating <laughs> about the challenges <laughs> of doing that. Uh, and, and of course, Cornell was one of the first, the very first of departments to be established in black studies. So um, wonderful to have you here as well. So each panelist will take, you know, um, just a few minutes to pick up on some themes. The themes I, when I first wrote them to ask about were having to do with the questions of scope, uh, Africa and its diaspora, and how to think about that as a kind of integrated project. Questions about method, the questions of method during when, when the department was first started and the questions of method now um, in, in, in the interim have been evolving and are interesting questions around that. And, and then it, finally questions about professionalization, questions about um, what, is it, you know, what kinds of institutions do we need to sustain us, sustain the field as we go forward uh, now granting the doctorate in the field. So please welcome our distinguished panelist. Um, and we'll, we'll first hear from Martha Biondi. Well, thank you very much, Tommy. Um, 
for that introduction and thank you very much for inviting me and organizing this event and I want to thank Joey and all the other members of the staff who've done a <coughs> superb job of making things um, really flow really smoothly and wonderfully. Um, uh, I just want to apologize. I have a lingering cold, so I'm going to try and speak loudly, but um, bear with me if, if, if I struggle a little bit. Um, okay, as Tommy said, I'm at Northwestern, and we have a PhD program in African American Studies. The PhD program there is now 14 years old. Um, we have um, graduates on, who are now in tenure track positions, and some of them have already received tenure, at Princeton, Wesleyan, Florida Atlantic University, Loyola, DePaul, Brooklyn College, the University of Hawaii, Cornell, Penn State, among others. Um, and also many of our graduates have received postdoctoral fellowships as well. Our anxiety in the beginning um, when we were creating the program was over the legibility on the job market of an interdisciplinary PhD. We wondered how we could structure our program to amplify our student success on the market. What we did <coughs> was structure it, especially our coursework, so that students could become, on the one hand, conversant in the interdiscipline or multidiscipline of African American studies, as well as in a traditional discipline. We hoped that this would broaden their chances of landing tenure track positions. And I would say that this approach has um, generally helped us place graduates, to, graduates in a range of programs <coughs> and departments, including African American or Africana studies, but also history, English, ethnic studies, sociology, gender and sexuality studies, and African studies. So, so we have PhD graduates in African American studies who are in all of these different departments and programs today as tenure track faculty. But having said that, it turns out that a bigger problem for us than the newness of interdisciplinary PhDs was actually the Great Recession of 2008. Mm -hmm. This hit our first couple of cohorts hard since job list listing shrunk, and it took a while for the market to readjust. And of course, we're all living through a steady decline um, of tenure stream positions nationwide. Thankfully, to help newly minted PhDs in the short term, a bunch of new one and, year, one and two year postdocs emerged, including one in my own department. Moreover, our concern that a PhD in African American studies would face more obstacles on the job market than a PhD in a traditional discipline um, uh, has proved to be largely unfounded, at least at my institution. In fact, I see history and English PhDs at Northwestern having a harder time on the market than our own. In, re in many respects, our PhD programs, all of our, I think all of ours, have helped usher in what we might call the era of interdisciplinarity. And this is not just true in the humanities, but across the curriculum. We still have our original design of encouraging a specialization in what we call a track, which roughly corresponds to a discipline uh, or a cluster of allied disciplines, in, ad in addition to broader training in the particular debates and paradigms of black studies. But I suspect we are due for a rethinking, as our students increasingly push against these traditional borders and boundaries. These days, it's harder for them to necessarily select one track in which to ground their study. They have come of age in the era of interdisciplinarity, and it's truly their intellectual home. So in many ways, I feel like we've been supplanted by a new generation, and, and that's good. So we'll see where they take us intellectually. So I'll, before passing, um, passing the mic on, I'll just say a couple of words about scope. Um, you know, the name of our department is African American <coughs> Studies. Um, but for a long time, we've felt as a faculty that that name conceals the global nature of our scholarship and of our teaching. So we decided we should change the name. So we had a series of workshops and faculty meetings on this topic. And, you know, that then brought out everybody's dream list of what a new name should be. So we actually had trouble agreeing. I think the top contenders were African American and African diaspora studies, because some people said, well, we've got to keep African American in there. We don't want to just go to African diaspora studies. And then we then a lot of people just reverted to the position of, look, it was black studies initially. That's who we are. That's what it should be. So then that then galvanized a large faction. So in the end, it was like a fascinating discussion, but we couldn't find a majority that was like in, it, you know, in favor of something um, besides our, our, our traditional name. So we kept it. Um, I don't think that, I think we were 
disappointed we couldn't come up with, you know, couldn't agree on a new one, but I feel like that conversation is going to continue. But still, we don't, you know, we don't include African studies the way you do here. Um, you know, Northwestern's had a historically strong program, African studies. I would say it's weaker now than it's been historically, um, even as there are Africanists in other departments like political science and history that still have some strength. Um, we, you know, we've had strengths um, in, in Latin American history and black European studies um, in years past. So it is a, an important and changing part of the work we do. Um, and again, our students are pushing us in interesting directions in terms of the diaspora. Um, one student was studying um, people of African descent in Sri Lanka, and she's got a tenure track position now. Another student taught himself Wolof because he wanted to study the importance of hip hop in Senegalese politics. Uh, and he has a tenure stream position now in African studies. Um, uh, I'll just give you a sense. This I'm quoting from our website in terms of like giving you a specific sense of how we identify our scope. At the turn of the 21st century, African American studies, like many interdisciplines spanning the social sciences and humanities, is becoming more responsive to and influenced by a contemporary world that is increasingly interdependent and subject to diverse representations and questionings. The world is no longer centered, if indeed it ever was, on the singular cultures of self-enclosed or autonomous nations. The multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, and gender dimensions of national spaces and histories are accelerating to prominence under the influence of economic and cultural forms of globalization. Intellectual orientations are increasingly being underwritten and overwritten by questions of transnationalism and deterritorialization. So I think that that, you know, in part kind of reflects the direction that we've been going in and continue to move toward. Uh, uh, toward. So I think I'll stop now and can save other comments for the, for the Q&A, but thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Is the sound okay? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, so thanks, it's really lovely to be back here. Thank you, Tommy, for the invitation. Um, in some ways, I'm gonna take up Tommy's uh, call to think across my experiences, which were as a graduate student here from 2004 to 2009 in African American studies, and now teaching in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern. So in 2004, I applied to be a doctoral student here in a department that had recently been renamed African and African American Studies. The admissions process had presented unknowingly perhaps the central tension that would mark my time as a graduate student. I was asked to select a primary field. I chose sociology, so mistakes were made there. Um, it's not what I do. And I learned that I would devote a considerable amount of my coursework to graduate seminars in the sociology department. In some ways, the primary field was explained to us as a strategic tactic. The primary field designation, I was told, would ensure my marketability in a conventional discipline. It would allow me to sell myself as both an interdisciplinary and disciplinary scholar, and thus increase the number of tenure track jobs I could reasonably apply for when the inevitable and daunting time came. But in other ways, the primary field was explained as an intellectual commitment, as in it is necessary to be well-versed in the methods of a conventional discipline, or interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity requires speaking across, with, or through established disciplines. And the prerequisite to a successful interdisciplinary dissertation is the mastery of a conventional disciplinary grammar. As students, we learned quickly and on the ground the challenges of interdisciplinary work as we negotiated a university infrastructure that did not always know what to do with our bodies in graduate seminars that did not anticipate our presence. We confronted bureaucratic issues. Would space be reserved for us, say, in the sociology theory seminar when we were not really sociology students? Um, why were certain primary fields more hospitable to us and others more seemingly troubled by our presence? And we confronted intellectual issues as well. What does it mean to craft black studies projects in spaces that don't share a black studies vocabulary, politic or even ethic? Or to craft those projects in spaces that don't, that don't necessarily have an interest in blackness? The years passed and as I approached my first foray on the academic job market in 2009 with a project that had a singular commitment that I would argue always transcends disciplinary lines, which is black feminist theory, I quickly learned that despite my certification in sociology, my project and its investments were most legible in black studies and in women's studies. I learned that I had been in sociology, but I was not of it, and that this was perhaps the most quintessential black studies formation in and not of, in and not of the conventional discipline, the university, the institution. 
For me, black studies uneasy relationship with disciplinarity, including disciplinarity's promised legibility and security, reflects the field's uneasy relationship with the question of method. So I think we need to think rigorously about what it means to at once champion interdisciplinary graduate work and then to push our students to get trained and often to get trained in the name of method outside of black studies. This is a formation that presumes even if subtly our field's inadequacy. And it's a formation that neglects the innovative methodological work unfolding within black studies proper, work that conventional disciplines increasingly cite, deploy, and take up. The call of late in black studies has been to become what Christina Sharp calls undisciplined, to do work that in her words, quote, requires new modes and methods of research and teaching. For Sharp, what black studies promises us is a space for practicing undisciplinarity. And we might ask as, as faculty, where precisely do we go to learn or teach undisciplinarity? Is it about learning and then unlearning? And how do we negotiate this bind, which I see as not just an intellectual and pedagogical question, but an ethical one as well in dialogue with our students? It also seems to me that it is no longer sufficient to tell our graduate students that sustained engagement with a conventional field promises them more job options. We must ask how do we, especially in the interdisciplinary fields, value undisciplinedness in a job market that is still structured around disciplines? I'll suggest that we learn from ongoing collaborative work among the US doctoral programs in women's studies, which has been committed to investigating who gets hired for entry level tenure track positions in that field. Namely, do those folks have degrees in women's studies? The chairs of the doctoral programs in women's studies, along with graduates of those departments, have collectively generated data on their graduates and published it in the journal Feminist Studies, and have asked, how have we, feminist scholars, devalued the very degree we are training our students to earn by not hiring scholars with women's studies doctoral degrees? So to ask it in the terms of our conversation today, who better to teach black studies than someone trained in it? And how better to signal our solidarity with our students than by valuing what we train them in? So this brings me to the question of professionalization. As a black feminist theorist who's part of an intellectual tradition that thinks critically about the university, I see black studies as a crucial intellectual and political node that puts pressure on the elitist, celebrity-driven, hierarchical logics of the contemporary university, particularly the contemporary private university. Or at least that's what we should be doing. So how might the culture of professional training move beyond simple preparation for the job market? And I pose that question with a full recognition of the importance of job market. People need to eat, right? But how might we, for example, take seriously pedagogy as something we should teach and discuss, since most of us will spend time doing it? How might we, as faculty, continually demystify <coughs> opening processes like tenure in our mentoring work with graduate students? How can we, as faculty, talk candidly about the nuts and bolts of academic life with our students, including questions like, how do you take notes? How do you read? How do you maintain your ethical compass in the midst of this profession? To me, these acts of demystification and clarity are actually central practices of the Black Studies Project. And finally, as we continue to think about the institutional life of Black Studies here and beyond, I wanted to end on a final note. So when I left here in 2009, I had written a dissertation that considered Black women's places in the pornographic archive. I was deeply interested in what Black feminist theory had to say or could say about an archive of sexually explicit images. And I was also afraid. I was afraid to show my images on job talks, afraid as to how colleagues would read my body and its imagined desires. In the years that have followed, a cohort of scholars has produced an amazing body of work on black erotics that centers not just what Patricia Hill Collins would call black sexual politics, but what Lamonda Horton Stallings would just call the funk. So this is a cohort that takes seriously Jeffrey McCune's assertion that in his words, radical black study requires intimacy with deviance, not departures from it. I found myself compelled by this vision of black studies, one that I think we do practice at Northwestern where I teach now. This is a vision of black studies that demands that we center what has been excised from black studies proper and that we refuse the lore of epistemological respectability in the service of comfortable institutionalization. Even as I flag what I see as a feminist transformation of the field, it feels important to me to acknowledge that this transformation is still all too rarely manifested in the daily life of departments, where women still perform the bulk of the service work, the mentoring, advising and shadow advising, listening and counseling that is both utterly necessary and wholly invisible. It's the work that doesn't count for anything except promoting a departmental culture of humanity. How might we model for our graduate students as we professionalize them, as we prepare them to sit where we are sitting, a black studies project whose ethical and political work starts at home, so to speak. One that both centers black feminist and black queer work and lives, breathes, and enacts those ethics where it counts most in day-to-day in day -day life. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Tommy, and thanks to everybody who's here. Uh, those of you who may have grown up in various uh, Southern black religious traditions may be familiar with the idea that when one gets up in front of the congregation, um, one says, giving honor to God. Um, now, we're not, we're not in church, but I will start by saying, giving honor to Skip. And thank you <laughs> for everything that you've done here. <laughs> And I mean, that, I mean that in the most complimentary uh, way. So thank you for all that you've done um, here at Harvard, but also for the field, more, most seriously for the field uh, at large, including your work to popularize the work that we all do uh, in isolation and to also teach a much, much broader public through your work uh, in media, which I much admire and, uh, and, and, and appreciate as well. So please take that in that way. Um, you know, I have this job at Penn, which I got in 1995, in part because Harvard hired Evelyn Higginbotham, and that position became open in the history department, and I'm the person who eventually uh, took that over. So I have many reasons to be uh, grateful to Harvard. Um, <laughs> so uh, when, I ca when I came to Penn in 1995, um, there was an Afro-American Afro studies program uh, there already, which was my uh, both emotional and intellectual home, even though I was living in the, in the history department. I taught for it. It helped sustain me. Um, and I then became a part of the long process that resulted in us forming a department in 2012. But through the kind of um, structural differences at Penn, we actually had a doctoral program before we had a department because admissions there uh, come through graduate groups rather than through departments. So there are models for other inter inter interdisciplinary fields, including comp lit, to also be able to admit graduate students. So we started admitting graduate students in 2008 and got the department in 2012. Um, I think our thinking always was to admit a really small cohort and to offer them kind of a boutique uh, departmental experience uh, in an institution uh, where graduate training, and it's not singular in this way, but where graduate training is is often so alienating that we really wanted to create a different ethos and the kind of emotional commitment that we've heard this morning on this panel from, from both for undergraduates and for graduate students <coughs> who come through that uh, who come through that program. So we've been taking in more three or four or five students a year, but of course the actual cohort on the ground or in the department is is obviously uh, you know much larger. And so um, just to do what Martha did is give you some sense of the parameters of the department, and then I'll try to get to these questions uh, quickly. Um, we have a faculty of 14. Uh, six of us are 100% only in Africana Studies. Eight of my very hard working, stretched in many different ways, uh, colleagues live in at least one other department or school, um, but come together to do this work. With the affiliated faculty, we then have about 36 or 40 Penn faculty who are engaged in teaching and, and helping our, our students. Um, when I began to look at our alums who are out in the world now and are at various institutions, uh, Wesleyan, NYU, Dartmouth, uh, Rutgers, Michigan, Illinois, Arizona, the University of Cape Town, um, and UC Santa Cruz, and they are hired in African American studies, history, English or literature, uh, anthropology, religious studies, cinema studies. So I think we feel that our alums are representing what we were trying to do both in terms of the emphasis from the beginning on interdisciplinarity, but also to, um, to make sure that we meet our obligation to help people train in ways where they can um, get jobs, do well, and continue to train the generations that will come after um, we are all gone. And so we feel good about that. It's been a lot of work, um, but I think it's been also very gratifying work in that way. And so I want to just turn to the questions that Tommy had asked us to think about. Um, one of the things that actually is helpful at Penn is that it, it, there, it's very capacious. There's a, there is a lot of flexibility both across schools and disciplines. And so doing interdisciplinary work there is really quite easy. 
Um, we also have a model that permits graduate students to do joint degrees. So you can get a degree in history and FM, and you come out, you, you have to work hard and satisfy both sets of obligations so that we've had great success with students who are jointly degreed in history, FM, or music, anthropology, English, comp lit, and some across schools as well. And so that means that we have an amazingly diverse reach of method and period and geography represented uh, among our students. So that's been really interesting, I think, for us. Uh, in terms of how we train our students, and this goes to the question of canon, um, and which I think was also raised in your, in your question uh, to us, we've kind of created our own canon from all of the kinds of works represented by people here in this room. And this is the core reading graduate bonding experience for our graduate students uh, when they come through. Uh, but the question of methodology, which we're also to think about, really comes immediately when students begin to think about very specific projects. Um, and um, so, there, we are, you know, a department where all of us were trained and tethered to methods in history of, so, of the social sciences and a wide variety there, uh, political science, law, sociology. And I think the thing that we try to kind of, the, the way we kind of hold ourselves together is that we've always seen what we do as a, as a global black studies project. And so we are in an Africana studies department, which includes the three tracks. Uh, Africa, um, U.S., and uh, an African diaspora, you know, writ large, and we try to hold those those things in tension. So both undergraduates and graduate students can essentially specialize in one of those tracks, but everybody's sharing a great deal across the board uh, in the way that those those tracks um, kind of work their way out in a, in a student's life. And so I think the other thing that I'll say by way of emphasis is that we've also always had a commitment to race in this hemisphere. Um, and we and we have, um, uh, meaning a focus on South America, Latin America, Canada, um, and its large African immigrant populations and connections with, the Ameri with, the, with African Americans in the United States and then the Caribbean in particular. And we've also had strengths in languages at Penn, uh, African languages broadly and Arabic as well, which is, has turned out to be a really important part of what we do because we've also been able to have links with, with through faculty with people who are doing work on race in the Middle East and in the modern Middle East. And so that, that also has been one of the things that I think distinguishes us so that we have a graduate student who is of Afro-Turkish descent and who's doing work on um, uh, African communities uh, in Turkey, uh, you know, right now. And so that's, I think we've just benefited from having an institution that allows us to, you know, to really um, stretch out in that way. Um, the other thing I want to say about doctoral training and is that um, part of what I think we're also obligated to do is to try to train our students for the psychological stresses of this profession and for the psychological stress of graduate training itself, um, for the uh, risk of alienation and isolation, and also for what it means to be working on subjects about black people in whatever disciplines and wherever they are and in whatever uh, time period, but how to deal with the psychic cost of doing that. And those costs are real, and they're not driven entirely by identity. I think it's difficult for any student who wants to enter that world, because yes, you want to think you're going to do a project that's about black joy and pleasure, um, but any time that you begin to study black people, wherever they are on the globe, inevitably, you're going to run into the stuff that's not joyful. And in fact, uh, most of the time, you are dealing with, with work um, where white supremacy and, and racism impinge on whatever your subject, uh, your project might be, because you're interested in the lives and the culture <clears throat> and the history of black people. And so 
in addition to the normal isolating effect of being an academic, there is another layer there. And I think all of us, and I've heard that here all weekend, try to create spaces in these departments that do much more than teach someone you know, how to find a source and do primary research and write a good paper. I mean, we need to do that. That's the foundation of what we do. But we really do have to protect the psychological health of our students um, because you, we don't know what they come in the door with. And we also are teaching a generation of students who were blessed to grow up in the age of Obama and who were completely, um, and I remember that in the last presidential campaign, were completely floored by what was un being, un un you know, what was happening in front of our eyes. And so you have to tend to that, um, that the kind of psychological preparedness for this age, we need to be a part of that. Um, and then the final thing I'll say has to do with the, uh, how we take care of ourselves and the relentless work in this profession and how we begin to think about boundaries between what I call work and what I call life. And life is kind of everything else and how we also instill in them the necessity for certain boundaries uh, to pre protect themselves and also to enable them to do their best work and so that they might also be able to serve students um, in the ways that we try to. So I'll just say that for now and, um, and look forward to hearing what you have to say into our conversation. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Morning. Thank you. Um, first, I want to congratulate the department uh, on this milestone. Um, <clears throat> may the next 50 years be even more successful than the first. <laughs> but the next 50 years will be more successful based less on some of the factors responsible for the past <laughs> and more on what that past has given birth to which is the doctoral program. <laughs> as important as our majors and minors are, the professionalization of the academy, the disciplinary tribalism that characterizes the lives of the disciplines that has led my friend Louis Gordon to call what he calls disciplinary decadence, um, <clears throat> means that the legitimizing instruments that undergirded our efforts in the past may not avail or do so with the same power in the future. That future looks to me to hinge more and more on our PhDs. And I think I'm the only one on this panel for whom possibilities and challenges have the most resonance. <laughs> the PhD program at Cornell is only six years old. Mm. <laughs> and we graduated our first three students last year. And it's a happy coincidence that the person responsible for two of those three students is right here with us, Professor Carol Boyce Davis. Please. <clears throat> and this is important because it's a, depart it's a program that uh, the new students, we just had our prospective students come visit, and they were asking, so what do you see as the future? So I said, that's you. <laughs> if you think that we have a prepackaged thing that you are coming into and you're going to inhabit, uh, disabuse your mind of that. As we build this right now, some of the work that all of you will be doing when you get here will be part of the founding instrument you know, of this program going forward. And as we try to calibrate what we are doing to reflect some of the problems that we have found in the first six years, to make sure that the seventh year does not reflect those problems, and then prepare for the tenth year, for the fifteenth year, what you are doing will all be part you know, of the conversation. So that's what I mean by really embodying the challenges and possibilities you know, uh, for us. Um, so we don't have anything. And remember, Cornell used to have a professional degree called the MPS. And that was what the graduate program was until it became a department. We got married into the college, and then the PhD was you know, started. Um, and many of those who took the professional degrees have actually gone on to very significant academic careers at very top institutions. So there's a path you know, from that. But now, 
this is a PhD, and this is what we are trying to build. Uh, we have two seminars, you know, that our incoming students have to take. Uh, one is the historical, political, and social analysis, and the other is the literary visual and what's the thought? Cultural, you know. Uh, and that tells you the, you know, two main branches, you know, in the department. Uh, students have to take all of them, but they are very crucial to what we call the formation, the professionalization, you know, of the students. There are other seminars that they take that are designed for their teaching, you know, going to conferences, preparing themselves, you know, for the market, but those are ancillary, you know, to these two. And the reason why I mentioned these two is that they have something to do with some of the rest of my comments, you know, in terms of possibilities and challenges. <clears throat> This goes to the heart of one of the guiding questions you have been kind enough, uh, Tommy, <clears throat> to share with us for this panel. Can, ought, or is a multidisciplinary field be a discipline? <laughs> Notice the difficulty in the very formulation of the field. And we deploy much more than multi. We have trans, we have cross, we have inter. <laughs> And each one of these does not mean the same thing as the other. Otherwise, you know, there will be just too much verbosity, you know. Uh, I know we are verbose, but, you know, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, we do know the differences. <clears throat> Simultaneously, yes, most of the disciplines in the academy took centuries to emerge, and others have emerged in more short of time frames. But here's the challenge for us. If you've been around for 50 plus years, and you still don't know what the heck you are, <laughs> and you are sure that you are not the equivalent of liberal studies, humanities, or cobble your own together studies major at the undergraduate level, there may be grounds for doubt as to your prospects and how much respect, not to talk of resources, you should have. We are not training for area studies, definitely not our program, and from what I've had around yeah, the table, yeah, yeah. you know, that's not yeah. what we're doing. And not merely because of the odious origins of these concerns, our area, quote unquote, happens to be the world, a fact that is increasingly captured by the idea of global African studies, black world studies, and so on. At the same time, location matters. If in the past, and unfortunately well into the present, the experience of African Americans had been integrated into the narrative of this country, and this had been reflected in the very idiomatization in the American imagination of disciplinary syntaxes, I have no doubt the motivation for and direction of our field of study will have followed a different trajectory. But that has not been the case. So what that means is that the fact that we are located in the United States requires us to privilege the African American experience you know, as where we jump off from. But when we jump from that, where do we jump to? Do we jump to the rest of the diaspora, the Caribbean, you know, black Europe, you know, Asia? And of course, there is the home continent, you know, itself. And I had to deal with this when I was back in Seattle because we called our program Global African Studies. And then the dean wanted to merge all such programs under a center for interdisciplinary programs. I said, no. I got me a two-headed monster. The African-American part of it is domestic. It's not international. If you take us to international, we lose that. And if you keep us there, then we cannot deny that we open up to other parts of the you know, global African world, and that's international. So keep us where we are. You can keep the international. You know. And that tension continued, and I think that that is part of what we have to deal with, and that becomes very important, you know, when it comes to the doctorate. What do we put on the menu for the doctorate, and how do we navigate the treacherous path from disciplinary formation to possible, but I hope avoidable, disciplinary decadence? The answer to this question depends on how we calibrate our disciplinary ambitions while insinuating our graduate students into the quote-unquote disciplines for mutual enrichment and transformation. Uh, on a personal level, this is the most difficult because the elephant in the room 
everybody knows, and Tommy can attest to this, is always Ancona West here, philosophy. <laughs> and it's interesting how philosophy is always the absence in many of the discourses about African studies, global African studies, black world studies, and so on and so forth. And that becomes very important because philosophy is also cornerstone in how the very structure of our subjugation was constructed. <laughs> so in a very real way, how do we, using philosophy as just our example, and we find the same problem in sociology, even though American sociology is now trying to clean up its act by pretending to recognizing Du Bois's pioneering role you know, in that, we don't have that in philosophy yet. <laughs> and you still have people, I hope you don't have them here, who still think that American history, African American history is a sub to people who just want to do identity <laughs> because they don't think that it's history proper. And we're talking of 2020, and we still have to deal with that. So that's also part of what we have to do <coughs> when we try to say to our students, we want you to be legible beyond black studies. So what price do they pay for that? And how much of the disciplines do we really have them take in order for them to be that without losing the primary constituency you know, that their PhD will be in? Um, I'm for that, but it's not something that comes very easily, and we struggle with that. <clears throat> One problem we face is how we underformed our incoming classes, and Professor Griffin talked about this yesterday. Um, how underformed our incoming classes are when it comes to their sense of history of the movement, of ideas and debates, of genealogies, of personnel, and of artifacts. <clears throat> to use one example, much of the connection between the continent and the United States iteration of the diaspora and those of the UK and the Caribbean is either a vague presence, if not a non-presence for many people under 40 in this room. <laughs> What I mean by that is that the success of the civil rights movement led to a fracture of the solidarities that marked the independence struggle and the civil rights movement, and both coming from a fundamental orientation about the place of black people in the world. Many people are under 40 don't get that as part of their training when they come to us now. And we have to find a way <laughs> to sort of teach people that, they should have got it in, in their undergraduate education. They should have got it in high school. But we all know it's not happening, you know. And when they come in, and you then say to people, you do need this, you do find some pushback. <laughs> because uh, I was at an institution recently to do a review for them, and they say, it seems as if our students just have these five names, you know, that they all come with, and they, you know, reel them off. <laughs> and that's where they take off from. And I said, I thought we were alone. And I think this is what I call the underformation you know, of our incoming classes in terms of what they think they need to know in order to do the work you know, that they want to do. Uh, so it may not just be our students. It may also be their parents and many of their teachers who have been underformed by some of the historical ruptures that have marked the solidarities that provided the crucibles in which our discipline was forged, and I put discipline in quotes. Uh, these are some of the things that I want to put before you, and I hope that the discussion brings out even more. Thank you very much. So I, I, I really want this to be a dialogue. I know lots of people have, have questions, so I don't want to take, take a lot of time. Maybe I'll just do just one quick follow-up to get your thoughts and anything you might want to add in terms of responding to what others have said, um, feel free to, to add those, those thoughts. Just one just thought about our own department. Um, like I, I mentioned, you know, I'm reading the initial uh, uh, idea for doing a PhD program and thinking about that. And I think that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, Skip and Cornell Evans can uh, correct my errors in how to think about this. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a, there's a pragmatic, Kind of a pragmatic question, and maybe an epistemological um, um, taking Tiger's invitation to throw in a little philosophy in. So, on the um, 
so on the, the part of the question, I, I, there's two sides. So that I think one is just a, a is a speculation about the market, as Jen suggested, a kind of like, well, if if people have you know, deep training in a discipline, even if they do go interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or even undisciplinary in some ways, that they would be more competitive to get positions in traditional departments if they sought that. And we've had a lot of success in placing our people in traditional departments as a result. So one was a thought that practically speaking, that made a lot of sense yeah. to, to, to do that, even as we want to emphasize experimentalism and reaching across disciplines and so on. I would say probably epistemologically, the way I would think of it um, is in, like, in a lot of disciplines, you know, you go in and you're trained um, in the discipline and then you just start applying it to things, right? And, and I always think of it the other, the other way around in black studies. So, you know, you start with the question or the problem. What is the, the question I'm trying to answer? Is there a problem I'm trying to solve here? When you get clarity about what that is, it may turn out that the methods that are apt for it cut across the traditional disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so you don't, it's not so much you go in thinking, you know, like a celebration of interdisciplinarity, you know, for its own sake or, or just like we just need to be trans, but it's like the, the questions and problems that we're trying to address require reaching across. And that's part of the reason why we want that education. So I think it's, it's the, yes, it's practical in part, responding to our sense of what the market is asking for and what higher ed, the state of higher ed, and what it would mean to when in a place, especially in the social science and humanities outside of economics, where there's not a lot of growth. And you, and you want to be able to get those spots if you can. So there's that. Um, uh, but there's also this, this question of, like, what, the, of, of you know, prioritizing the question or the problem and, and making the, the, the method fit that, uh, I think, is, is the way we've, we've typically um, looked at the question. And one, one other comment about, I think, how we're thinking about it, too, and I guess this is practical as well, um, you know, one of the things that I think we've been able to do, I tried to, to emphasize this in my remarks yesterday, uh, by having kind of real strength in the disciplines in addition to being able to reach out, it, it allows for us to, uh, not just here, but in other places, to be situated across the university and to influence this overall mission. So by not sort of like necessarily having us all and just like we're just in this one place, but we're, we're everywhere. Yeah. And we're helping to, to kind of shape the thing in ways, but that requires being able to get access to those, those other dis traditional disciplinary departments. I think that's kind of how we've thought about it. Um, thought that maybe partly as provocation, but other people will have other, other thoughts about that and feel free to, to, to respond as you see fit. Um, the other question I just wanted to put to you um, is about, uh, professional organization, because it's a thing I guess I think about, um, you know, as, as, as Ty would put up, you know, you, you're, on the one hand it's global black studies, on the one hand it's like this idea that we're, we're trying to do everything, um, but we don't, there's not really, you know, organization to do, I mean, because if, if we're not doing area studies, right, then you're, you're, you're not necessarily looking to the African Studies Association, or you're not, and there's a SALA, which is greater and is expanded, and our dear Evelyn is, is the president of, uh, is expanding lots of ways, of, you know, outside of just history. It's its founder, Carter G. Woodson, one of our own. Um, uh, but still, that's not global black. That's not global black studies in a way. So there's a question of like, what's what are the prospects of, or is that a, 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 a worth doing? I mean, to try to build something that will advocate for the interest of our field in a time where um, we can't expect a lot of lines, faculty lines in, in the field. And I'm just curious, I've talked to Farah, is Farah still here, here, here? Yeah, Farah. Yeah. Farah and I talked about this at the Angela Davis conference, because I was thinking about this issue, like, well, what, what do we, should we build something like that? And what would that, what would that look like? I know that's a lot to put on the table. Like what? Well, a professional organization that's not ASA, that's not American Studies, that's not, you know, um, uh, Asala, but something that if, if we're, the, the, the idea of a scope of African, African American Studies, of global black studies, there isn't really anything that, does that? Aswad. 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 You, so, and you think that's the? Do you think that's a place for us to? I mean, I, I mean, I. I in terms let, of. Let, let, yeah. let me. Do you have a thought uh, about yeah, this? No, I have a thought because yeah. you had that was one of the things that you asked us yeah. to uh, think about. Although I didn't, I didn't say anything about it, and because I am. I think when you are involved, as many of us have been in actually building programs. Uh, 
you, I, I may still be down in the weeds, but I think that there is actually a great utility in us being able to have even this kind of nitty gritty conversation that's basically a comparison of, of how we're doing these programs. That's one level. You're talking at another level, which I, I also appreciate. But I do think some sort of mechanism for people who are doing, who have these programs to get together every now and then and talk about the kinds of things that we raised on this panel in terms of you know how we're training students how they're you know whether they're, they're doing well how how we're dealing as i said with the psychological pr stresses of the profession which i think is also you know a bit here um, i think that would be enormously valuable i don't know how or whether it should be institutionalized or whether the various institutions that have doctoral programs might take terms from time to time and gathering people together in much in ways similar really you have doing multiple things here, but in a way that's, you know, that's similar to this, a, sort of a, a one day here and there. Um, but I think you're asking a much, a much broader intellectual question, which I am not prepared to answer. No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to come in as you see. As you see fit. Uh, no, uh, you, I just mentioned that as well, and I think somebody else in the audience, as one outfit, you know, that is out there. Can you tell people about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that the right vehicle? I'm not sure, you know. Uh, and some of that has to do with some of the issues that Professor Gates raised yesterday about NCBS, which we often don't talk about, you know, but people have all kinds of ideas about at all kinds of places. Um, the way that I see it, you know, and I thought about that with your question, is that I think that's something that's going to be created by the future that we are creating. <laughs> And what I mean by that is, over time, we're going to have fewer and fewer people whose profiles will be similar to mine or yours, who trained in the disciplines and came into, you know, as we produce these PhDs, they will begin to staff these programs. And I think there will be some constricting of the boundaries in terms of eligibility for these positions as we produce you know, more of these PhDs. Uh, and I think that might be the only time, especially when they begin to connect with what is going on in Europe. And I think that's a very important part you know, right now. Uh, the UK now has its first professor of black studies, you know, which never happened before. Uh, you do have the Nordic countries that are spending big amounts of money now, not just on African studies, but on black studies, because people there are becoming, you know, more clamorous, you know, for all those things. I think it's only at that point that we can begin to, uh, to think that. Uh, right now, what we have is a lot of concentrations with a dash of this and a dash of that, that always talk and they are always about people who know one another, work with one another. I'm part of some of those networks, uh, but I do know that they do not address the question you're raising. I tend to agree with um, um, Barbara. I think that it, in some ways um, it would make sense to have occasional convenings of, of PhD programs in African American studies, I think for practical and professional reasons. But to imagine that as an ongoing intellectual organization, um, I mean, I tend to think, des despite the desire by some for a kind of unified interdisciplinary vision of African American studies, I tend to think faculty's tastes are just going to be Catholic and expansive. I mean, we once did an exercise of, you know, we sent around to 14 faculty, tell us the journals that matter to you, that you read the most, that you publish in. I mean, I think that there were, they were different. Every, every 14, you know, all 14 respondents put three or four different <laughs> journals. And so that reflects, like, those, that's, that, those, Journals are what we see as our intellectual home, who we're in conversation with. There was some overlap, but it was a reminder to me that, like, in some ways, it's like herding cats a little bit how we can be. But, um, and, but I feel like to me, I don't see that as a downside. You know, a lot of people in African American studies see that as like, ah, oh, you know, we need this unity. We need one thing, one organization, one journal. And so, you know, I think that these are long-standing differences in the field. And so. Um, you know, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, but I think I think intellectual vitality and expansiveness is important. But I do think having um, regular 
um, meetings to sort of share notes and strategies and stories would be exciting and I think would be really interesting for our grad students. Um, but I also think, like, you know, agreeing with Ale Fume that, you know, this, this more unified intellectual uh, organization might be something our students do create in the future. I mean, the future is unknown and uh, is unwritten, and it's not going to be us who create it. So we'll see where that goes. Can I add one quick thing? So uh, when I was a graduate student here, I think we felt sort of, uh, we, felt, we felt we were a conference list people, right? Like uh, the sociologists had a place to go, the historians had a place to go, where do we, where do we go? Um, and I will say in the 10, 11 years since I've graduated, that question is not a question for me anymore. American Studies Association is the place where folks who work in African American studies go. And I feel like that conference has sort of come to bill itself as a black studies conference, right? And that's become an, that move in the last 10 years has been an interesting one to me. As, and so in my last book, I was thinking quite a bit about the history of these professional organizations. And so I've come to be interested in like, what are the organizations that have reimagined and rebranded themselves to fill this sort of gap or absence of a single home for a Black Studies Conference? Um, the National Women's Studies Association is another place that has reimagined itself as a Black Feminist Theory Conference over the last few years. And so I think it's interesting to see how these other professional organizations have um, allied themselves on an institutional level, even if it isn't in a day-to-day -day level, with a Black Studies project for a variety of reasons. And so I think there, to Martha's point, like I don't think we'll find, I don't think there exists a singular home. I think our tastes are idiosyncratic and eclectic. And so we found these other professional organizations start to speak in a kind of Black Studies language more and more. And I think our grad students probably half go to ASA, but I think a lot go to Asala mm -hmm. as well. Yep. So. Um, yeah, and I think that so something that's more of a consortium kind of model mm -hmm. might be a way to begin for us to have a forum to have this mm -hmm. this conversation among ourselves and with our graduate students, uh, you know, through some occasional convenings and whether it becomes something more than that or institutionalized, you know, you know we would see. Uh, in time, but I do like the underlying impulse um, because I think when you do graduate admissions, which we're all in the kind of the middle of now, you can read graduate admissions files and I'll say, well, this person should go here and work with that person really isn't a fit for us because the programs have begun to have identities uh, and not not solely because of who, of the faculty, although that, of course, drives it, but, the, but they become, they it develop their own kind of culture and strengths. And I think, uh, you know, building on that and certainly trying to establish an ethos of cooperation and collaboration among the, the programs and not competition uh, would be a really, really good thing. Thanks so much for that. I mean, one of the things that we, you know, every few years we, there's a visiting committee and some of you in the room have served on that visiting committee. Um, and there's a, a lengthy report about the department and suggestions. and. And, and over the last, the last few that we've received, it's a pretty persistent question about the vision for the field. What is, what is, how do you, you have all these things going on? How, what's the identity and, and, and that kind of thing? And we often respond, well, in a way that I think that you all responded, um, well, it's, it's very pluralist. You know, it's like a lot of different things. There's sort of overlapping interests and approaches to a set of questions and to try to press and say, no, it's this um, is kind of a mistake. Um, even though we, it's a, the, the question that we get really every few years <laughs> is, well, what is it? And so on. I think our graduate students often feel a similar thing, like, well, how are we supposed to understand this thing that we're all supposedly doing in a way? And, I, and we, we tend to repeat again, well, look, it's a pluralist enterprise, so you can't, it's hard to like, say, well, it's definitely this and so on. But I wonder just maybe to follow up on, on Jen's initial remarks, um, you know, it's just maybe just a follow-up. I mean, so on that, on that, that suggests a, a way of thinking about method too, right? I mean, it suggests um, maybe, uh, uh, as, as Cornell will often say, when it, you know, it's not like either or, as it says, <laughs> both and. Um, um, uh, a kind of pluralist attitude about method as well, whether, so that there are, are some who will, will work in a very traditional disciplinary way, some will draw on certain disciplines, some will resist the disciplines, um, and, and so on. So I just, this, just to invite you, just, cause just curious, and as a product of our department, um, and with grad students here, I'm sure we'll follow up on this question, if that's something that you would find congenial or. Yeah, I mean, I think I tend to agree with Martha's comment about sort of the culture of interdisciplinarity that marks our graduate students. Uh, in conversations with our graduate students over the four years at Northwestern, they've pushed us to think about the question of discipline more. So as you know, we have a student now who's, who says, you know, I want my, my training to be in uh, filmmaking, 
right? And we don't, I don't think a lot of us thought of filmmaking as a place where a student would get a sort of conventional training, even though we don't have the kind of primary field structure that Harvard does. But we were like, oh, okay, for, so for a lot, or we have a lot of students who come in and they're like, my method is feminist methods, right? And I think I was trained to think of method as you go to anthropology and you learn to write an ethnography, right? Or you go to, you go to history and you learn to work with primary sources. And more and more, our students are, are expanding that conception of what constitutes method by pointing to the interdisciplinary fields as the site where their methods come from, right? Queer studies is going to be my method. And I found that, that, that to be a really productive and generative push in our field, right? That, that's forced us to think, um, it's not just pluralistically, it's like to, to think um, in a very unbounded way about what constitutes both method and discipline, right? So I mean, I remember I told my, my story about sociology because I remember thinking, who am I? I'm a scholar who works in feminist theory, right? But that wasn't necessarily legible as a discipline in the moment in which I was applying, right? Um, and so that question of like what constitutes a discipline seems to be a part of what's underpinning the conversation, right? I think if you just to add to that, I think when you think about methodology, I mean, I've learned this from, from graduate students who are comfortable using what essentially mixed methods. Mm -hmm. So you can have a project of students doing ethnographic work and maybe trained in feminist mm -hmm. ethnography, but also is doing primary historical work and is learning that from me, mm -hmm. but learning the that other method from someone else on our faculty. And it allows them to basically imagine these extraordinarily creative, wonderful projects, uh, but they are also more difficult because the student has to really be committed to learning and becoming proficient uh, in more than one method, which is not, a, not necessarily an easy thing to do. So talk about interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinary approaches, it's really, it, but it, it also just opens up the possibility for the work, especially work about black people. Uh, you know, as I said, across time and space. Uh, and in some ways, it may be, it enables and opens up the possibilities of doing the work that really, really most needs to be done. And I say that as someone who's a parochial, um, you know, <coughs> Americanist historian, <laughs> proudly. Um, but I get, it just opens up all sorts of possibilities. Thanks so much for that. Let's take some questions. Um, hands are flying up. Um, Professor Gates, don't do Cameron. Mike, Mike for Professor Gates. <laughs> this is what happens when you run a department or a center and you think you're in charge. Thank you. It was a fabulous panel, and uh, you gave us so much to think about. When I was an undergraduate, and I think it was true for the undergraduates who uh, demanded the creation of this department, black studies was uh, defined by content. What was black studies course about black people? I mean, it was a tautology, right? One of the great uh, pleasures that I've had intellectually is team teaching, um, intro to Afro course, first with Evelyn, a great historian, and then with Larry Bobo, a great sociologist. And every week, I was reminded that I'm not a historian, though I have a BA in history, but I'm not a historian, and I'm not a sociologist, because the questions that they ask of the text and the way they answer it are completely different than the way I ask questions of a text trained in the field of the close reading of literature in, in the English language. So I, I, I don't think that we could get around the fact that disciplines or methods are languages. That, you, you know, to create an utterance, you have to master a language. And that's a metaphor for intellectual inquiry. And I'm elaborating, Barbara, on what you just said, your last answer, which is you have to know the difference between the aesthetic, um, how can I, the aesthetic state of being between a Terry McMillan novel, and I like Terry McMillan, she's a friend of mine, and Beloved. Yes. They are not the same thing. And if you can't tell that difference aesthetically, then I don't know what discipline you're in, but you're not in the, the study of literature. Um, what did Toni Morrison write about in her master's thesis? So I know Hurston and Richard Wright, right? No, no, I'm being funny. She wrote, no, she, <laughs> that, that was a trick. No. no, she wrote about Virginia Woolf 
and William Faulkner. And she was very influenced by uh, Marquez. So you can't understand Toni Morrison without understanding Faulkner, Virginia Woolf. You can ask other questions of Beloved that historians would ask. Um, you, can't, you can write about Phyllis Wheatley in terms of the free uh, Negro community in Boston and the enslaved community in Boston, um, the Methodist circle for abolition, um, the, ab the beginning of the movement for the abolition of slave trade, but you can't understand her use of the elegy unless you understand the history of the elegy. So that is the problem that we can't get around. In terms of philosophy at Harvard, we hired three philosophers, and one we hired twice, him. <laughs> and Cornell hired Anthony Appia as the first African philosopher. So philosophy is very much at the heart of the way we defined uh, African and African American study, just as the history of art is, which made us very, early on, but that's because I was trained, I, I was an undergraduate at Yale, where Robert Ferris Thompson had the biggest class, starting in 1969 when I was an undergraduate. So I couldn't conceive the field without art history, and now I, I don't think anybody um, came, uh, uh, can do that. So I don't know how we produce, and this is Will Pruitt, one of my superstar graduate students, asks this question of us all the time. How can you all teach African American studies when none of you ha has a degree in African American studies? None of us has a degree in African American studies because it didn't exist. I mean, a PhD. No, nobody in our cohort. So we defined it um, inductively. If I, I was joking at a faculty meeting right before Christmas with Cornell and Evelyn, if Cornell Anthony, Cornell, Evelyn, and I, and then Suzanne Blier. We were the first ones hired chronologically, right? In the and Vernon was already here. If we had sat around and tried to define what the field was, we wouldn't have hired anybody. We'd still be trying to define what the field is. Rather, we went for stellar pe people whose quality of mind we thought was exemplary and built the field inductively around the brilliant people that uh, that we hired. Might not be ideal, but it worked for us, so. Thanks. Uh, I think, uh, Duke Cameron. <coughs> and then Bob. Thanks so much. Um, so, so I'm a recent alum of this department, um, an undergrad alum, sorry, um, and I'm now doing graduate, so I'm biographical note, I'm feeling a little bit of, a little bit of this interdisciplinarity and uh, anxiety. Um, so I'm doing my graduate training in philosophy um, at NYU, and I'm also gonna be starting law studies soon, um, and have experience kind of in technology. And I think my question was really just meant to be one about training in kind of like basic science research, and if that's a thing that's on the radars of any departments. I think maybe I imagine this being particularly topical. Um, going back to some of what Professor Griffin was speaking about in her keynote yesterday about um, climate change and black ecologies and also kind of AI and future of work. Um, is this kind of a set of training, like is basic science training in any of these areas a thing that's on um, the minds of departments, black studies departments, African American studies departments, and African studies departments um, at all? And if not, could it be, should it be? Um, yeah. That's a really, uh, that's a really important question, and I, I think actually about my colleague, uh, Dorothy Roberts, who runs under the Center for Africana Studies at Penn, a program on race, science, and, and society, and you know where she's doing work that's similar to Alondra's work, uh, where science is the interrogated uh, subject, but as for, and so she has had to sort of self-teach her, to self-teach what she knows about science in order to critique it on questions of race and genetics. And she did that work on her own after having done other, um, you know, other um, uh, training in departments that do sort of the history and sociology of science. Again, science is the, you know, is the thing that's being studied, but you can't really study it if you don't understand and don't know it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really surprised that, um, to think about whether we ought to be doing the scientific training ourselves under our rubric, which is fundamentally, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that would be great, but 
I we yeah. had a religious studies scholar, Sylvester Johnson, who was um, really moving his research agenda into AI. Uh, we had a religious studies scholar, Sylvester Johnson. He's no longer at Northwestern, but he was moving fully into, our, into AI. And he's continuing to do that work. So um, if you're looking for, um, you know, someone to talk to about that, and, you know, he would be an interlocutor. But, but I think that's a big challenge, frankly. I think it's really, really important. Or Evelyn Hammonds, who's here, as you know. <clears throat> Kirsten. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten Carter. I'm a graduate student uh, in the department currently. Um, I had a question. Um, I guess this is for the panel broadly, but um, both in Professor Shelby's comments and in Professor Gates's comments, there's been the implication that black studies is inductive, right? So that you start perhaps from a question and the methods follow. Or you start perhaps from a group of scholars and the field just sort of coalesces around them. Um, and I, that suggests to me a deep tension between fields which are um, canonical in important ways. So like I'm training to be a political theorist um, and Montesquieu just does, does not have a lot to say about the issues of like white supremacy. Um, and so I wonder what you all think as people who are um, kind of setting the, the tone for PhD programs about the, the, this tension between the fact that um, we're, we're in some ways being taught how to do things that don't answer the questions we actually have and that were we to fully pursue the questions we have might range beyond what the university is structured to provide us answers to. Uh, if you don't mind, yeah. can you please frame that question for us because I want to know what that question is for you as somebody training for political theory. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I can, I, I don't. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, so I can talk a little bit about like why I thought political theory was like the place to go and, I, and it has to do with, um, I think something Professor Gates says about like, you Speaking know, if you want to understand, right. yeah, go oh, ahead. is this better? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, sorry. Um, we're like, if you want to understand Toni Morrison, like you need to understand elegy in the Gothic tradition. Um, and I had questions about justice and I was like, okay, okay, well, who's talking about justice? And I want to go see what these, um, you know, what, the, what the, the intellectual trajectory of the word justice has been. Um, and I'm kind of unsatisfied by all the answers that I've found thus far. And so I'm, I'm interested in kind of, you know, what do you do if like you think Rawls is maybe kind of wrong about justice? Um, that's, not a, that's not specifically for you, Professor Shelby. <laughs> um, and so it, it, that, that's just sort of one example of what I think is a broader question. Right. Of like, you know, when you train in something that's deeply canonical, um, and uh, deeply traditional, what, what happens when that tradition maybe lacks the resources to answer the questions that you're interested in? Um, I have a very simple answer for you. You don't turn your back on the tradition, you engage it. And as you engage it, you try to show it what it's lacking, and you supply it. And I, I know that when I say you supply it, you're looking at yourself, I'm only a graduate student, but that's the whole point. I recently said to people, why do we keep obsessing about Hume's footnote? And why do we think that we need to argue with Kant when he uttered the ultimate non sequitur. As I see him, he was black from head to foot. Therefore, he could not have had anything useful to say. No, everything he had to say was stupid. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that's a non sequitur to a first year philosophy student who is listening in class. And once you call a non sequitur, what do you do? You call it out and you move on. You don't argue with it. So why do we persist, especially black scholars, in pretending to refute Immanuel Kant on that score? So why not instead go right ahead and present exactly what he said did not happen? That's what I mean by you supply. And I think the reason why many of us end up not doing that is that we fall victim to disciplinary imperatives 
where we think that this is what we have to do. And I am saying to you, no, that's not what you have to do. And there are people who have done that and have not tried to argue with the bell curve. Because there was a West African who had actually said that those who thought that there was something wrong with the black brain didn't know what they were talking about. And he knew <coughs> because he was a surgeon and they were not. And he published this book in 1868. So why would I now come to 2020 and be arguing with people who are peddling the same nonsense? All I need to do is to tell people they don't know what they're talking about and then provide the knowledge. Thank you. I would also suggest that you expand the body of what you're reading, that you, I'm, I'm not disagreeing at all, yeah, no, no, that you do I, that it. work, yeah. but that you expand your own definition of what counts as philosophy or political philosophy. Um, and so it's that, and then it's, it, it's, it, it's the material that you, that you want to engage in that, that it actually includes and addresses some of the questions that you're concerned with, but, you're, but you will need to do both, or yeah. more than both. Yeah. And all our greatest thinkers have done both. Du Bois, anyone? I wanted to call on Robert Hall. Um, for those who don't know, um, I was on the ad hoc committee for black students, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, was the department, was, was the group that are refined and, art and articulated the initial demands for the department. Um, so um, one of our pioneers, we can give it up to, to Professor Bob Hall. One of the unruly pioneers. Um, I will try to resist the temptation to give an oration, <laughs> um, which I'd like to do in you know smaller groups. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and I'm going to try to put a question mark behind. <laughs> the things that I say. Um, the first question is, what role does anyone on the panel or anyone else in the room think that archaeology should play in the curriculum of you know the mid to late 21st century uh, African diaspora program. And the, the second is um, kind of a historical question. The, there were a number of historically black colleges, such as Howard University, Atlanta University, um, North Carolina Central that were essentially, they had developed what I call feeder systems. So to say, the historian, take the historian, Helen G. Edmonds comes to North Carolina, not, not North Carolina Central, uh, yeah, Central, and <laughs> There's a whole crew of what, who later call themselves Helen G. Edmonds scholars. But, and she did her PhD at Ohio State. And she funneled her best students to Ohio State. There was a pipeline, there was a feeder system. Somebody, uh, Ira D.A. Reed or whoever else was, Tillman Cothran, sociologist at Atlanta University, they fed, you know, and they only had so-called terminal master's degrees at those institutions, but they fed people. And I'm wondering to what extent you think that's desirable, doable, possible to have some existing master's programs come to view themselves as feeders for some of the, you know, big time doctoral programs where you, you enter with the declaration of pursuing a doctorate um, and, and they don't admit people who, who 
admit to being seeking uh, a terminal master's degree. Um, and then the third and final thing is that there was a sociologist, uh, European you know, refugee from the Holocaust who taught at Tougaloo College. And there was a whole bunch of refugees, such refugees, who ended up getting jobs in historically black colleges. And then some of them were taught my parents at Hampton. But this guy, some of you may know him, Ernst Borinsky. And he developed this concept of black anti-associations, which doesn't mean anti-white, but um, when the Southern Sociological Society did not let black members stay in the hotel, or when E. Franklin Frazier was given a paper at the Southern Sociological Society in Louisville or wherever, they asked him not to use the pool because if it did and the guests found out about it, they would have to drain the pool. Uh, so there were plenty of people teaching <coughs> social sciences and history at historically black colleges. And about that time, in the mid-1930s, they formed what Berensky would call these anti-associations, like the Association of Social and Behavioral Sciences uh, initially in Negro colleges, or Association of Teachers of Social and so on. And then um, more recent, at various points along the line, uh, some of them after the crystallization of black power and after the crystallization of black studies programs at the predominantly white universities, you had, I call them fly-by-night organizations, uh, but of long standing, the Southern Conference on African American Studies Incorporated dates from about 1980 and is still going and it still publishes a respectable journal, The Grill, that comes out two, two times a year. Um, and for those who in graduates, early graduate school felt conference-less, as Jennifer put it. Um, those places have conferences uh, where the, 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 you don't have to fear the ide ideological rigidity of the National Council of Black Studies, or, or the, the perceived <laughs> ideological ri rigidity of the National Council of Black Studies. So, to summarize, the question, what's the role of archaeology? Um, how do you feel about the feeder, you know, the master's feeder institution notion, whether the master's degree is at a historic black college or a or, or so-called mainstream college? Uh, and then um, what role can the so-called black anti-associations play in um, providing outlets and generating networks that that don't really exist now, that connect with what I call black matrix associations. And they have annual meetings. <laughs> Thanks, Professor Hall. So we just have a few more minutes before we go to the lunch break. So if any of you would like to comment on any part of Professor Hall's um, questions, I'll, please feel free. Yeah, I'll just say something about the HBCU part <coughs> of your question uh, broadly. So the Association of Behavioral Sciences, Social Sciences, was a, I, I, if I recall, was established in either 36 or 37 in North Carolina um, and, brought to, and brought together um, black scholars and educators from all over the country. And then became, and it was also established as an alternative to the racial exclusion from the other organizations that were in place. 
and so it was it was it was that but it actually created an enormous network of black scholars and black educators. I'm doing some work on a, a black woman scholar, Merce Tate, who was at that meeting. She was teaching at Bennett at the time. And so I've actually kind of been wallowing around, if you will, in a good way in that early history. And I was surprised to find it in the mid 1930s, in the middle of the Great Depression. Um, and it then becomes a feeder network itself when when uh, those faculty you know move on to, to other institutions. Um, and I just want, so one thing I will say about HBCUs and the idea of some sort of feeder f f into programs, I think it's a great idea. Uh, and it certainly would would, um, would tap into the, the need in terms of pipeline programs. In our, prog in our program, both in, in our admissions and in our hiring, hiring, we've tried to pay pay particular attention so that we have students who were trained at Hampton and at Spelman, both as graduate students and actually on our faculty. Uh, Grace Sanders Johnson is a, is a Spelman uh, alum. And so, um, but I want, so I want to think more about that in, in, in a historical sense. Archaeology at Penn actually is still alive and lives in the Penn Museum, which now has reconfigured all of its galleries on Africa, which includes both the artistic artifacts as well as the archeological. Uh, and so there's now just the beginning of a project of figuring out how that then connects with what we're trying to do in African studies. And, and um, to his credit, uh, Takufu Zuberi has been the one who's been spearheading uh, that. And so that's a, really sort of an exciting opportunity for us. So that's all I'll, you know, I'll say. I think archeology span has a, has a place there, um, absolutely. It, it was eventually, it was eventually, <laughs> right. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that um, uh, Professor Savage was talking about, or, and that she's studying mm -hmm. one of the affiliates, yeah. political scientist Mertz Tate, Harvard trained, by the way. 1941. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that um, it was really the Association of Social Science Teachers at Negro Colleges. So that the, the, the white faculty who were on Negro colleges that had integrated faculty, and in those days, some Negro colleges had predominantly white faculty. They also were part of those networks. They gave papers at the meetings. They published papers in the journal and so on. Then there's an, another layer that's even a lot of the historical black colleges published research reviews. Re, re, you know, Southern, FAMU, as example, which is kind of you know a deeper level of obscurity. But uh, it shows that some of those folks were not just lying down <laughs> intellectually. No, it was very, and it was also very cross-disciplinary. Yes. Everybody, everybody was there, including Du Bois was at that founding meeting. Yep. And the interesting anecdote about that is that at the end of the meeting, the women who, women who were on the faculty at Bennett and Barbara Scotia invited all the men from the conference, all, and it was mostly men at the conference, to come for, you know, to socialize with them. They did not invite Du Bois because they thought he was too old. <laughs> At seven, I think it was 71 at the time. <laughs> Just a quick comment, um, answer to your question about MA feeder programs, if, if I understood you correctly. I mean, we, we have, um, you know, whether the Columbia Masters Program or the Cornell Program or University of Chicago, we've definitely admitted, especially in years past, students who had these MAs. And I think we've seen that MA training as really important. Um, um, for the success in, PH, in, in a PhD program of a lot of our students. I think one caveat is, and I'm not, I'm not very closely familiar with the financial structure of a lot of these, but I do think a lot of them are tuition paying. So you worry about debt, you worry about the financial implications of encouraging students to get an MA, so. Yeah. Uh, the point about archeology span is the one I want to address. It's not just archeology, span <clears throat> it's also more broadly classics. <laughs> And when I talk about the underformation of our incoming students, that's part of the problem. 
because people then suddenly think that classics is a white thing. <laughs> and that means dismissing some of the most important parts of the black experience in the world ever. And what that has meant is that it's the people who are doing Afrocentrism, who are part of the society for, I think they call it classical civilizations, mm -hmm. uh, who reduce everything, unfortunately, to Egypt, not even Sudan, mm -hmm. though they are beginning to expand now, and not Ethiopia, and not the history of Christianity in North Africa, you know, uh, and the contributions, you know, and all that. So part of what I meant by the underformation and where the problem will come in, you know, is that students come in from not the quote unquote traditional disciplines. So even those that come in from the traditional disciplines, their bases are very narrow already. <laughs> so their pyramid, you know, closes too quickly. <laughs> And those who are coming from outside of those are even narrower. <laughs> and then, you know, they have all kinds of misconceptions about what the degree they have come in is supposed to be about. We do need to address that. So we're out of time now. Um, uh, Olufemi, Barbara, Jen, Thank Martha, you. Thank thanks you so, so much, much for doing this. Please stand. <laughs>